So, Florence, we wrote a paper together. And we, we call it coping and co-creation, one attempt and one route to well-being. Yes. So, Florence, why, why actually did we write this paper? So, we wanted to write a paper talking about extremism and extremist individuals. Uh, and then, as we were writing that paper, we realised that we needed to write a theoretical paper uh, first uh, about the root of identity before we could start talking about extremist uh, individuals. Yes, and then I was invited for a call on well-being and we we thought, okay, well, well, not, why not write a paper on identity and well-being? And that led eventually to this paper. Yes. Yeah, the paper that we're going to discuss. So this is a theory paper uh, and that basically means uh, that we integrate ideas from different fields uh, in such a way that they combine with very little friction and that the ideas enhance each other. Uh, yes. And we really use a lot of fields. Uh, so uh, biology, management theory, psychology and active cognition, identity research. Yeah. Um, sociology. Yes. International relations. International relations, yeah. Political theory. Uh, auditory cognition, physics, security studies, not to forget. Uh, yeah, that's the one I study, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So uh, it basically is is an, in, an integration of all kinds of different fields and, and yes. they fit really well together. So that is the nice thing. Yes. So let's simply uh, go through the paper. Uh, yes. And the paper starts with an introduction, but we can kind of skip that. Uh, so let's go to, to section one called core cognition. So uh, that first section uh, that is, uh, we call it core cognition because we think it is the cognition that pertains to all of life, that is shared by all of life. And the key point of life is that it remains alive because it does stuff. Uh, so it is being by doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, an agent uh, is the thing that is alive. Actually, it's a living agent. Uh, but what is an agent? An agent is something that does stuff. And a living agent does stuff in order to remain alive. Yeah, so it is yes. itself responsible for its own continuation. Mm -hmm. So that is kind of the key point. And uh, the, another key point is that well-being is directly related to that. Uh, mm -hmm. Well-being is actually just the distance from death. Yeah, so uh, the more viable you are, the further you are from death, uh, the more well you are. Uh, so it is the task of any living individual to ensure its own well-being and hence to ensure its own distance from death. So the better the agent is being by doing, the more well it is and the more well-being it pos can possess or create. Exactly. Yeah. And so it's actually fairly simple, that part. Um, and then we defined uh, two forms of cognition, uh, mm. one form of cognition for survival and one form for thriving. And why do we separate those two? Well, actually for a very simple reason. And that uh, is the reason that when you are in a problematic situation, uh, you want to solve your problems and you want to get out of the problematic situation. And yeah. then you need a form of, of cognition that is aimed at solving your problems but it is also at the same time aimed at uh, removing the need for the activation of this form of cognition. So what it actually means eh, is that if you solve your problem, then you don't have a problem anymore. So you don't need your problem solving cognition. Exactly. And then the thing uh, is, is, what is the what is the other form of cognition? That is the form of cognition that you want to execute whenever you don't have problems and hopefully uh, most of your life. And uh, that is a form of cognition that we call co-creation. And uh, co-creation is basically about avoiding problems uh, as long as you can. Uh, so it's a, it's a completely different form because it, this is aimed to perpetuate itself while the coping form of cognition is aimed at ending itself. That uh, success yes. means that you don't need to activate yourself. Well, and so what we what we propose or what we kind of define uh, is that intelligence is for uh, coping, for solving problems. And mm -hmm. when you uh, were intelligent, 
and you solve your problems, then you don't need your intelligence as such so much. And then the other form of cognition takes over, which is much yeah. more related to, to wisdom uh, and, and which we call co-creation. Yes. To some extent, this is summarized uh, in, in figure one of the uh, paper uh, that is uh, about live demands. Yeah. And live demands is actually also fairly simple. An agent needs to ensure uh, that it remains alive and viable uh, so that it's its own body and its own well physical uh, essence. essence yeah, <laughs> is, is maintained. But uh, as a living entity, it is dependent on its environment. And that also entails that it should ensure that the environment, the habitat, is not degraded. And yeah. in order to prevent it from being degraded, you have to contribute now and again, or quite often, to your habitat. Yeah. And that is the key of co-creation. Yeah, so with co-creation, that is why we call it co-creation, uh, you ensure uh, that your habitat is, uh, that you don't only take from your habitat, but actually, uh, on the average, contribute to the habitat. And that yeah. leads to the gradual growth of the habitat and the subtotal, the, the sum total of all the contributions that life gives uh, to habitats all over the world is the growth of the biosphere. Yeah. So this is a really important driver uh, driver of, of life. Uh, yeah. Uh, and the short term thing aimed at problems is on the left, uh, the, the, uh, aimed at maintaining and protecting agent viability. Yeah. While uh, on the right, uh, it's more co-creation, and which is aimed at maximi maximizing uh, environmental and habitat quality uh, so that you uh, can live in a world that is actually very easy to live in. Yeah, a world full of opportunities. Indeed, yeah, compared to a world filled with problems. Yes. In the next sec section of this paper, we then link the concept of well-being and adequacy. Uh, so obviously all life strives to be well, but some life is better at striving for wellness than others. And this is essentially what adequacy is. So adequacy uh, can be defined as the ability to avoid problems arising altogether. Uh, so that coping uh, is rare, uh, and effective and that co-creation is the sort of primary um, mode that that agent is uh, living in. Uh, the habitat viability is protected at a very high level. Uh, the carrying capacity of the biosphere, so the the uh, uh, the agent's inputs into the uh, environment are very successful, so the carrying capacity of the biosphere increases. Um, and in the long term, the agent's needs are satisfied, hence very few problems. So an adequate agent is generally pretty successful at uh, creating the conditions for the preservation of its own well-being. Whereas an inadequate agent, an agent which is not so good at this, uh, is defined as uh, kind of linking to what Chia just said, but it's uh, defined as a tendency to self-create prolonged or worsen problems that keeps an agent in this coping mode, in this coping trap. Uh, so inadequate agents often, as they're problem solving, uh, because they're always constantly focusing on trying to solve the next short term problem which keeps coming their way, their long term uh, goals and viability is completely neglected. So hence, the problems keep on coming as the long term is, uh, is is so neglected and not looked after. That then brings us uh, to a to a new topic uh, that is what we call behavioral repertoire and worldview, mm -hmm. and that has to do with the repertoire you have for coping and co-creation uh, and mm -hmm. whether it is actually sufficient for the situation that you fi find yourself in. Yeah. And. That has a lot to do with worldview. And what is a worldview? Uh, that is basically the set that all that uh, the agent takes as reliable. So as true uh, in the sense of that it reflects uh, the state of reality. And because you assume that it is true, you base your behavior on it. Yeah, so if you don't think it is true, you can't base your behavior on it. 
So the worldview is kind of the set from which all your behaviors uh, are spawned. So we have two concepts, a behavior repertoire and worldview. And worldview is a set of all that the agent takes as reliable and hence uh, can base its behavior on. Mm-hmm. While the behavior repertoire is a set of all behaviors that the agent has access to. Yeah? And yeah. that can be sufficient uh, to, or, or more than sufficient, and then you're an adequate agent, or it can be insufficient, and then you're an inadequate agent. And we have different ways of being uh, uh, adequate and inadequate, but we come to that. So this is uh, kind of explained uh, in figure two of the paper. Yes. Um, and that is also called the behavior repertoire. And in that... The wheel fig- of life. The wheel of life, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, in that figure, uh, that the core, the wheel, uh, is uh, strongly associated with a concept called core effect. And core effect has to do with our deepest moods. And uh, it has to do on the, if you go to the, the central axis of the wheel, uh, from being activated, deactivated, or being uh, activated, and you can, in, uh, and when you are activated, the world is typically eventful. Um, and on the horizontal axis, uh, that can be kind of a pleasure axis, but in this case, we made it a high viability versus low viability axis. So what we typically want is we want to avoid the low viability side, and we want to go to the high viability side, and we want to remain there. So that is the also, uh, do we want to avoid coping or do it very effectively so that we can then return uh, to the right side, what's uh, the co-creation side? Yes. And on the uh, diagonal axis, uh, we have uh, we have two axes that are associated with that are associated with the constraints and the possibilities that you have. Yeah. So in a nice, easy to live in world, there are few constraints that you have to satisfy. So basically means that you can do whatever you want and all is fine. The opposite of that is that you have to satisfy many constraints and many constraints means that you have to uh, to be very careful not to make the wrong choices uh, because mm-hmm. and then you can die, for example. Uh, so yeah. that is one axis, uh, which is has to do with how difficult is it to choose your behavior. Yeah. Then the other diagonal is uh, whether you have few options, whether the, the world that you live in is deficient or you don't know how to use the world, uh, so it feels deficient, yeah. versus you have many options. Yeah. And, and this is then also associated with how you build up your behavioral re- repertoire. Uh, it can be inactive and narrow, uh, which you, everyone starts like that uh, as a baby. Uh, and then you can learn to make your uh, your, your uh, repertoire more effective. And that is a fairly quick type of thing. You have to learn how to deal with problems. Uh, but it also means that you live in a world of problems because that's the only thing that you can deal with. And so the, the other way, that's the horizontal route, goes from narrow to broad. And that is something that is more effortful because you have to sample the world really well and you have to learn from all kind, all the diversity of the world. And the idea now is that you uh, have to combine both. You have to go to the right in order to become very proficient in co-creation uh, and, and be very comfortable in almost every aspect of the world. And at the same time, you have to learn how to become a really effective problem solver so that when you end up in problems that you can easily get out of the problems again. So that is pretty much everything of this picture. I forgot one thing, and that oh. is uh, the motivations that are also there. Uh, the oh. words to avoid and to end, they are associated uh, with the, the motivations uh, to end uh, being on the left side, while the motivations on the right side, uh, wanting to perpetuate a nice situation or wanting to aim for an interesting situation, uh, that is uh, something that you yeah, uh, voluntarily search for and want to maintain. Uh, so yes. I think we covered it all now. Uh, then coping and, and co-creation is the second section. And we go in a little bit more detail about what coping and co-creation actually is. Yeah, so the key point of coping is that it makes the world more predictable 
by reducing its complexity and creating systems of agents or objects or whatever with more predictable behavior. Uh, and in order to increase that predictable behavior by imposing control on, on, on agents and objects and, and, and et cetera, uh, they bring threats to self under control. And that is an active process and that requires energy, it requires resources, it requires continual maintenance, mm -hmm. but in doing so, it promotes security. And, and what is security? It, it basically means that the threats are brought under control. So yeah. that is the key point here. Yeah. And the only way to do that uh, is create something of an in-group of agents. And what is an in-group of agents? Uh, that is a number of agents who have the same limitations and hence are, uh, have the same kind of possibilities and mm -hmm. uh, the same ideas of how to, well, what is a good idea. They, they, they share the uh, same set of benefits. Same worldview. Uh, same worldview, yes. And that means uh, that uh, they can work together. Um, and they work together because they impose limits on themselves and limits on others. So Each that other. everything within the in-group remains within the limits of what they can deal with. That also means that outgroups are defined as those who do not share these limits, either because they have different limits or because they do not have those limits. Mm -hmm. And but, but irrespective of whether outgroups are having different limits or no limits at all, they frustrate coordinated coping in the eyes of the in-group. Yes. So the in-groups really want something like a standardized individual that is easy to work with, while yeah. That is not necessarily the case for everyone. Yes. So that is kind of the key of coping. Co-creation is a quite different thing. I mean, co-creation co -creation does not uh, reduce complexity as such, but it tries to make the world more predictable by promoting uh, the unconstrained natural behavior of all the agents. And, and so if all the agents do whatever they would normally do, that also creates a manner of stability and predictability. Um, and you do that uh, to ensure that every agent has access to easy need satisfaction and, uh, and that entails uh, that you facilitate uh, a high quality uh, habitat where every agent can find whatever they need uh, to be kind of happy. And this creates a safe environment uh, where safety is defined as a situation or state with truly positive indicators of the absence of viability threat. So the difference with coping is that it tries to control all kinds of threats. But here it is about the absence of uh, threats. And because you can't notice an absence, you, everyone needs to communicate, uh, oh, I, uh, I see no uh, viability threats. Uh, so I am going to do stuff that I really like uh, and that makes, for example, the sound and, and via the sounds, everyone can communicate, oh, I'm safe, I'm safe, I'm safe, I'm safe. So everyone communicates, everyone is safe, and that allows then uh, the maintenance of an environment uh, that feels truly safe and yeah. in which everyone can safely co-create. Yes. And uh, so this also then brings us uh, to what we call generalized wisdom, which is basically implementing this. This is, an, this is the balancing skill uh, to contribute to the biosphere. Yeah. And, uh, so that everyone does his or her little bit uh, to, to improve the world a little bit, to make it more safe. Yes. Uh, which is very, very difficult. But still, we know that life as a whole is able to do this. So that brings us to section three, uh, which is uh, about identity, uh, but identity in a special way, namely as learning to co-create and to cope. Yes. Um, the uh, well-known identity researcher Bozonski uh, defines identity as a self-generated theory of me or self theory. Uh, but actually, it is a theory of me as an actor in the world. Uh, so uh, that is reflecting back to being uh, by doing. Yes. And we made a table uh, where we combined the, the basic structure of identity uh, to, uh, the, to our ideas about coping and co-creation. Yeah. So that is table three. In, within 
uh, identity research, uh, we have uh, two main uh, axes. One axis is whether you are, uh, when you can commit to certain life strategies. And the other axis is whether you had uh, effective self exploration and deliberate yeah. self exploration. Yeah, so, why these two axes? Well, the stable commitments mean uh, that your strategies work and that you don't have to change them. So it is basically a measure of whether your strategies are adequate for the world that you're living in. That's uh, the horizontal axis. Uh, that's the vertical axis. Uh, so, so the line goes horizontally. Yeah, the line goes horizontally, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you go from below to above. Yes, yeah. And so we have stable commitments. We have no stable commitments uh, in uh, when, when basically you have no good skills and you have stable commitments when you have effective skills to deal with the world. Yes. And the other axis is uh, about self-exploration. And that is whether you become an individual uh, uh, who is unique versus yes. an individual who is not Who's really not, unique. And not unique. No. And... Uh, so that leads to four combinations. Yeah, so the combination that is called an achieved identity, uh, yeah. that means that you have uh, self-explorated uh, yourself, uh, you, that you went through a crisis in which you uh, liberated yourself from all kinds of uh, baggage that was not very useful from your youth, and yeah. you replaced that uh, with more uh, effective stuff that is of your cho choosing and that ensure uh, that you know yourself well and that you have very effective uh, uh, life strategies. Yes. And we actually uh, interpret this as that you have good coping and co-creation strategies. Yes. So, and because you have that, uh, you can actually self-actualize uh, because you are hardly in problems, and if you are in problems, you can, you can solve your problems fairly quickly, quickly. and then you can return to uh, the self-actualizing state. Uh, so that is the achieved identity. Yeah. And then we have identity moratorium. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, which is uh, that the self-exploration crisis is still in progress. So it hasn't led uh, to uh, really high quality skills that you can really rely on. No. And hence, uh, you can't make your identity kind of stable. And so these are typically people who search, uh, yeah. who, who go from one uh, mode of getting to know and understand themselves to another. Uh, and, and I think we yeah. know those kind of people. One ideology to the other ideology. Yes. 40-year-old, uh, or... the, these people who are 40 years old and they are still seemingly on their gap year. Yes, uh, and, and I tried yoga for a while, and then yeah, and, uh, went on some silent and retreats, and another skill, etc. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Lots of exploration, but not a lot of results. Nope. At least not yet. Uh, but, not yet. But there's, there's still developing, uh, development going on. It's a work in progress. Yes. Then we have the identity foreclosed, and the identity foreclosed means that there that the development of the identity has actually been stopped. And how has it been stopped? Because these people did not really self-explorate, uh, but instead adopted uh, the norms of society as their basis in life. And so yes. they become very proficient in adhering to all the rules of society, adhering to the rules of their ideology, adhering to the rules of their uh, religion. and. And they have a, a very effective uh, but targeted behavioral repertoire. Yeah. So uh, w whenever uh, they are in a situation that they can deal with, they can deal with it uh, very effectively. But when they are brought out of that situation, uh, they are confronted with their inadequacy to deal yeah. with that. The first thing that they are going to do is to change the world towards what that they feel adequate again. Yes. Uh, and that has everything to do with the authoritarian uh, state of mind. Yes. Uh, they, uh, the foreclosures, uh, they, they let on to a narrative, an ideology or whatever. Uh, and, and whenever they feel uh, that they are brought out of the comfort zone, 
Uh, the first thing that they're going to do is to get rid of to, to of that of the diversity yes. that makes them feel inadequate. Yeah. And that makes them intolerant to diversity. And that is especially the case in uh, in a fearful situation. So where they are already fearful, uh, they become hypersensitive to uh, to diversity that I can't that they can't deal with. Yeah. And this is what uh, Karen Stenner, uh, an, uh, an, an authoritarianism researcher, calls the authoritarian dynamic. Yeah. Which is basically that intolerance to diversity scales with your level of authoritarianism, which is the normative identity uh, style and, and identity foreclosed, times the uh, normative fear level. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the unspoken motto of the normatives is we are right and you must change. Yes. To comply with to our comply with us, to adhere to our rules and our standards and our routines, because we are right. Yes. And, yes. and Florence, and you can best do the identity diffusion because that is your Oh, team. the diffusions. Oh, they're just so confused, aren't they? They're so confused. So at the bottom uh, of the at the in the bottom uh, left hand corner of our table, we have the identity confusions. And these are people who live in a world just surrounded by so many problems and they don't seem to have any of the correct skills, either coping or co-creation to, uh, to 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 deal with any of these problems. So they have a lot of undeveloped uh, uh, skills. Um, also, as a result of these lacking skills, often when aiming to improve their well-being, they often are confronted by not only their own inadequacy, but they accidentally create more problems for themselves. Um, and uh, though their intentions are often good, they, they just don't have the capacity to realise these intended outcomes. Um, and as a result, they're... they're they're very confused. They're often quite frustrated with the world and themselves. Uh, and it's also, uh, it, uh, they don't have any stability either in their identity. It's, it's very fluid. Um, and, uh, and, and also, yeah, I think, I, yeah, overall, uh, very little self-development, a very narrow and uh, minimally effective behavioral repertoire um, and just inequipped to deal with the world and the problems that it is inevitably filled with. Yeah. So uh, here uh, we, we, we connected in an, on a theoretical level uh, the ideas of, of coping uh, and co-creation uh, with the structure of identity. And it was kind yeah. of nice that it fitted so well. Yes. Uh, so this is one of the contributions of this paper. Yes, it's almost like it, it's almost like it's all part of a big picture. Yes, yes. So, talking about a big picture, let's make the picture bigger. Yes. Uh, our fourth and last section uh, mm. was uh, about two routes to general well-being. Yes. And so maybe maybe I can start this part. It's more your part, but I can start with the first part. Yeah. Um, that's the difference between safety and security. Mm. And. I am a soundscape researcher, so I, I am interested in what makes, for example, a nice environment nice. And one of the things that we discovered a few years ago is that uh, in a nice environment, there are indicators of safety. And we tested that and we indeed found, for example, that very vulnerable people, uh, like people with dementia, for example, they like indicators of safety in their environment and that makes them relax. The moment you get rid of those, uh, then, then they become agitated, they get problem behavior, etc. So we kind of understood that. And here uh, we, we, we separated the terms uh, security and safety. And we already defined that a bit, uh, but it's good to do it again. Um, so safety basically en uh, entails uh, that everyone communicates, I feel safe. And that allows a situation of co-creation. Security means that the threats are brought under control, and that means that they are controlled, which takes, which entails the active suppression of all kinds of unwanted diversity and all kinds of uh, and other threats. So that is an active process. It takes much more energy, and yeah. those seem to underlie 
two important concepts that we use in section four, and that is ontological security and psychological safety. They are yeah. completely different beasts. Yes. And, and you came with ontological security. Yes. So essentially these two, um, these two concepts outline the way that we conceptualize coping mode and co-creation mode to creating well-being. And the uh, the security side is actually um, wonderfully wonderfully um, analysed uh, in the by uh, various scholars of sociology and international relations, and this is this concept of ontological security, um, and it's all ontological security. The first uh, um, first time it was really uh, developed and used was by a, uh, a psychoanalyst called Lane. Uh, and essentially, uh, he uh, his speciality was looking at people who were having psychosis uh, or were really sort of very, very mentally unwell. And what he found is that people that were experiencing psychosis or, uh, you know, were really sort of mentally unwell, had a very unstable sense of who they were. And they didn't have a stable idea of where their life was going and who they were on a continual access so he kind of developed this idea and he said this is what i'm going to call ontological security it's the it's it's the the person's security uh, and confidence that they are um the sort of the same person today as they're going to be tomorrow okay. uh, then came a along came a sociologist um giddens and instead of only applying this theory to the mentally incredibly unwell, he decides to extend it across the whole of society. Um, and basically what he uh, he argued was that ontological security was uh, very important for an individual's like security and uh, happiness and well-being. And what he state uh, what ontological security is by his um, understanding is the secure feeling that an individual derives from having answers to problems and solutions to issues in their everyday life so that all of these issues are um, sort of kept under control so they can carry on with their routines and get on with their everyday life. So essentially what ontological security is, it is the secure feeling one derives that today will be more or less the same as tomorrow. Essentially, it is security derived from predictability. Um, and what uh, Giddens was kind of uh, uh, visualizing here was a symptomless society, a society that didn't have the uh, didn't have uh, sort of uh, obvious symptoms that people were very uh, unwell, essentially, a sort of didn't have a high level of well-being. So a measure of ontological security is how comfortable someone feels in their comfort zone. And a crucial part of creating this well, this, this well-being within the comfort zone is this term habitualization. And essentially habitualization is the consolidation of routines um, uh, using uh, socially constructed um, myths and shared knowledge and stories and uh, all of these things uh, to, that sustain um, an in-group identity, which then provide the individuals with a, a guide for their their future action. So essentially, so habitualization is a, is basically the process of becoming ontologically in, uh, becoming ontologically secure. So it is um, taking in this shared knowledge and these habits and these routines, and hence you have a guide for how you should behave in the future. Um, and obviously, uh, as Chir mentioned earlier in the video, uh, in-groups are defined by this feature. They are defined by a common habit, a common habitualization. So everyone in the in-group um, uh, shares all of these um, all of these routines and all of this knowledge so they work very well together however everyone who is in the out group who does not share these routines who does not share these habits is seen as a threat to this oneness this sameness and this ontological security and 
as we are in the coping mode, threats must be controlled and diminished and extinguished. Um, and uh, another uh, thing that makes these outgroups so problematic is that it, when you are a foreclosed identity, you are only really familiar with your, set, your own in-group's rules and habits and shared identities. So you construct the outgroup's identity purely with reference to what you experience in your everyday life. So as a result, the outgroup is is always going to be um, constructed as inherently different, always problematic, with a uh, with a focus on uh, sort of like the difference rather than the sameness. Um, and hence, uh, you know, a, a lot of these processes of of uh, creating ontological security via uh, creating well-being via ontological security often involve othering and often are quite can be quite violent. Uh, they can be quite counterproductive as well. Um, and uh, so via um, ontological security, um, what you sort of end up is with a, a group of individuals who are very normal and they are all the same. And because they are so normal and the same, they are actually abnormal because they shouldn't they shouldn't be so that there's no uniqueness that it is all a, a shared sense of oneness. Um, and this is what Aldous Huxley um, calls abnormal normality but in our paper we call it pathological uh normality huxley uh, describes that uh he says something like these millions of abnormally normal people living without fuss in a society to which if they were fully human beings they ought not to be adjusted still cherish and they still cherish the illusion of individuality but in fact they have been to a great extent be de-individualized that conformity yeah. is developing into something like uniformity. But uniformity and freedom are incompatible. Uniformity and mental health are also incompatible. Man is not made to, to be an automaton. Uh, if he becomes one, the basis for mental health is destroyed. Yeah. And, and this this is what Lane is has identified. Yes, as, as kind of the ideal of his 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 work. Yeah. Uh, so so basically getting rid of all the symptoms of being unhappy, of being of all the symptoms of actually living, uh, living a full life. There are, there, is, there are no symptoms, but there is also no self-actualization because everyone becomes uniform. So now we're moving on to psychological safety. And uh, in this section, we uh, use um, the work of Clark and what he, his um, work is all about uh, creating successful and uh, motivating uh, teams. Um, and in his book, he essentially defines psychological safety as the condition where you feel included, free to learn, free to contribute, and also free to challenge the status quo. Uh, so so the, uh, the, the normal uh, without fear of being rejected, punished or excluded as a result. So fund so from the beginning, what sets safety apart from security? is this idea of unconditional acceptance. Whereas an in-group, you have to, uh, it's very conditional. You have to take up these uh, rules and routines. With safety, the only, um, the only condition is that you are a human being and you can join us. Um, so that then the second step towards uh, psychological safety is learning how to, uh, learning from um, the group and the environment and learning how to become a uh, an, a an adequate uh, agent. So essentially, this is all about um, learning from uh, people around you, learn self-developing. Um, and um, and from this, once you have uh, learned, then there is the step over um, into actually being uh, an actor an and really contributing to the environment. And th this is when contribution comes in from a very fundamental position. If you are contributing uh, successfully and, and therefore enjoying the environment you are in, 
of course, you are not going to want to harm that environment. So the, the environment, of course, becomes safer and safer. It's, it's completely, yeah, common sense. And then the final step towards, um, uh, towards psychological safety is challenger safety. And this is the idea that you can challenge the status quo without being fear, fearing rejection. And challenger safety signals that the individuals have overcome the pressure to conform and hence they can enlist themselves in co-creative processes, improvement and self-development and innovation uh, without fear of social rejection. And this is, of course, in complete opposite uh, to intolerance to diversity that yeah. uh, that the characterizes coping and characterizes the normative identity style. It, exactly. It is a celebration of diversity. Yes. Instead of trying to suppress it as much as possible. Yeah. And and which was kind of which was the key point of ontological security yeah, in, in trying to create all kinds of very uh, standardized individuals uh, without yes. symptoms. Yeah. Yeah. So we summarize this in a, in a little picture that is figure three, uh, which uh, we call the well-being ah. pyramid. Well, uh, there's also something you created it. I did. By doodling. Yeah, by doodling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you can do that yes, again. Yes, it's I'm sure some of you uh, recognize um, parts of the pyramid from uh, Maslow. Uh, it's probably one of the most famous um, pieces of exported uh, academia. Yeah, so what, what we did is that we basically <laughs> said uh, that the bottom is for dealing with problems. Yes, uh, and, that's the coping. And so, yeah, that's the coping part. Uh, and yeah. then we have the middle part hey, in which you learn how to co-create. And if you've done both, uh, then you end up at the top of the pyramid with, uh, well, maintaining well-being and, and, and especially self-actualization. Yeah. Uh, we say that the steps uh, is first uh, that your physical needs are met and yeah. then uh, that your security needs are, are met. But that actually this is security needs, uh, it's not safety needs. Uh, so this is about uh, that the in-group conditionally accepts individuals. Uh, yeah. And conditionally means that if you comply with the rules, then you are accepted and otherwise you are excluded. And, and But at a certain moment, uh, then the conditions for discontinued coping and uh, basically the absence of problems uh, is being met. And then you can progress to the second level uh, where uh, the a community unconditionally accepts you as an individual. Yeah. Uh, and then you truly are your belonging needs are truly being met. And well, the next step, of course, then is that you are as an individual, you can freely, freely learn, uh, freely contribute and freely criticize your community. Yeah. And with that, you can contribute to the community and improve it. Uh, and that leads then uh, to eventually that all the conditions for successful co-creation are met. Yeah, so this is our our kind of model of society. And, and then with uh, ontological security, kind of the only thing that you can really reach is the level uh, of the first one third of the pyramid. Yeah. Uh, and and, and the, the, you need uh, psychological security in order to reach the next level uh, and you need to master that really in order to, need to, to, to reach the top. Uh, interesting is that ontological security is still a theory which is being used up, into, up until this day by lots of sociologists and IR scholars. In fact, when I was doing my master's, I had to use the uh, theory throughout one of my courses. And I find it uh, surprising because it is obviously very flawed because it conceptualizes the world in a way where conflict or insecurity is inevitable because one group in groups security can only go up at the expense of another another's group. Um, which I thought is a, a, an interesting theory to um, teach to uh, crisis and security masters, but alas, we uh, we digress. In in this last part of the paper, uh, we we looked at two theories from a meta theoretical perspective. So we looked down and we looked at what are the the properties of the 
the theories. Uh, so yeah. one was very clearly started with all the, the what we call the ontology of coping, all the ideas that belong to coping, which uh, includes, for example, uh, the security thing, which is in the name, uh, uh, but also problem solving, uh, standardization and, and those kind of things. While the order was exactly the opposite. Uh, it was about safety. It was about uh, developing your individuality to the max uh, and, and allowing everyone to contribute freely uh, and, 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 and uh, un unconstrained. And so those are two different ontologies that we think uh, are, are really interesting and we have to discover them better, but they are in, in one of the tables of the paper that we have and we have skipped uh, for, for this moment. Yeah. We used the theory that we've developed to make a little bit more sense of identity. Uh, so that was a direct application of, of, of the concepts of coping and co-creation and adequacy, etc. Sure, we have a number of, of ideas of how to use this. Yes. Uh, so one is that we're going to uh, apply it to extremism study, which was the original aim. Yeah. And uh, but what we think actually there are many more things. Uh, so for example, the difference between the left and the right hemisphere, as conceptualized yeah. by McKilchrist in his book, the master and his emissary, fits also really well to the, what the master does, which is co-creation, and what the emissary does, which is problem solving. Uh, we have uh, the dual processing ideas about two different processes in the brain that also fit really well. Another application uh, might be uh, happiness research and education research in how to actually educate people so that they become both proficient in uh, problem solving, which is usually fairly well the case because that's what we do in education, but also become very good in co-creation. Yeah. So those are the type of things that we want to, to develop further with this work. And that is actually great fun. Yes. Yeah. So maybe a last question to you, Florence. What makes this fun? Um, because it's incredibly satisfying seeing all of these theories come together in such a nice, well-fitting way. And it's, I, I just pure, I cannot think it is coincidence. I feel that all of these scholars are tiptoeing around essentially the same ideas, the same constructs, the same ontologies. Um, and I feel that what we are trying to do is link them all together. Yeah, it's actually pretty simple what we do. Eh? We, there are so many examples of, of high quality insights that almost shout to be integrated. Yes, yeah, absolutely. They're, 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 they're screaming at you. They're screaming. Yes. So right. let's stop screaming then. Yes. Thank you, Florence. And uh, well, we might do this again at some point. Yay!